So hello guys, welcome back to another episode of The Coaching Corner with Mike Chatters, our in-house physio, then Jess, and also me, Pascal Floor, on the other end. So this time, of course, as always, we are starting off with a little bit of a catch-up. We're starting off with Mike first, though, uh, because, I don't know, Mike, that has been a long time ever since you've been on the last time, right? It's been a long, long time, actually. Um, I think I was. it was the last coaching corner. I think it was me, Jess, and Steve um, that we did about the um, female athlete triad and reduced mm. energy deficiency um, in sport and in athletes. Uh, so, And I can't remember when that came out. I think that was one of the first coaching corners that we did. <laughs> oh, well, that is a long time ago. That was ago, forever indeed. ago. That was, yeah, that was so uh, for the people who don't know who Mike is, <laughs> Mike, do you want to give a quick heads up? <laughs> yeah, so quick heads up. So I'm the physio at Revive. Um, so I'm not a coach, but I certainly, you know, with, with us being athletes and in general, you know, we pick up niggles, we pick up injuries. And so I'm just here to add a, a string to the bow of Revive Stronger and to really help clients help people if they're struggling with injuries struggling with their training um with limiting factors to their performance and trying to help them break those barriers so that they can train that they want to the way that they want to train and get the results that they want to achieve so uh, that's me in a nutshell and you are a competitive bodybuilder yourself yeah so i actually haven't competed for a long time yeah. since 2014 um but right now kind of um peak mass so before i um before I was coached by Steve, um, I dieted down and I got really, really lean, uh, which was when I came to the Cliff Wilson seminar. Mm. And um, I shaved my head and looked like a Buddhist monk. And <laughs> now I've grown a beard, I'm peak massing, so I look like a bear. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so right now, kind of peak massing. Um, and then what we're going to, what I'm going to be doing, my plan really is to um, have one more um, meso cycle of at peak mass then cut down a little bit then after christmas maybe run a few more cycles of of massing before then potentially getting into prepping for a competitive season but it's a little bit up in the air at the moment because i have some ambitions and aspirations to work at the commonwealth games which is next year in birmingham um, they obviously only come about every four years so if that is something which i'm fortunate enough to maybe be selected for i'd probably choose that um and maybe just postpone my competitive season for the year after so um a little bit up in the air but we'll see how things go sounds very interesting and just in case you're just listening to this episode now and you're wondering like how the hell does a 16 year old have such a cv um no mike <laughs> has just partied a lot here over the past couple of days no this is all yeah. just a joke he's just a little bit under the weather <laughs> yeah i've just been i don't know what's happened i've just been obviously shouting in my sleep or screaming at the weights in the gym and something's gone yeah. but i'm perfectly fine I'm, I'm healthy and the throat has just decided to not show up so yeah. sorry i sound like a 16 year old girl <laughs> <laughs> so you're right so speaking about 16 year old girls we move over to chess <laughs> am i 16 now no. i wish <laughs> i just i just it's thought three. that that's a good transition over to now yeah okay. talking with so, the female on the podcast here so just yeah. how have you been doing and i know you're very close to your first show so maybe you want to share a little bit about the contest prep so far or maybe you don't that's absolutely right as well no, I want to share. I'm very happy to share. Um, I am three weeks and two days out of my first show, which is a WNBF qualifier. Um, I am excited. I am tired. I am hungry. I am all the good stuff that you're on prep, but I am mostly super excited to step on stage. Um, I started prep in January, so this has been a long gas ride already. Um, I am down 10 kilos. I started prep at 64 kilos and I was 54 kilos this morning. So it's a huge chunk of body fat. Um, I had surgery on my elbow, uh, in April. So I had two weeks two and a half weeks at maintenance um, where I couldn't really train or I was just eating a little bit more. Um, but beside that, it's been deficit, deficit, deficit for the most part. I had a weekly refeed um, 
the second half of prep. Um, so that helps uh, quite a lot, but I haven't had a refeed in a while now. Like Steve sprinkles a refeed here and there, but it's mostly digging. So I'm flat. I am depleted. Uh, it's so hard to get a pump in the gym. So I look very just you know, stringy right now. So it's complicated in terms of like body dysmorphia. I feel very, <laughs> just feel very skinny now, but I am super excited. And yeah, cardio is high, calories are low, steps are high, but motivation is super high as well. So that's what matters for me right now. And yeah, so first qualifier in three, three, three weeks in two days in France. So I don't have to travel by plane or anything. I, mm. I can just drive my car, which is good. And then if I do qualify for Worlds, I still don't think that we're going to be able to make it because it's in three months and the US borders, it doesn't look like it's going to open anytime soon. So wow. I don't think Worlds is going to be an option th this year. So I'll probably do the WNBF UK show just because everybody's going to be there. It's going to be really cool to meet people and just connect in person and see people that I haven't seen in forever uh, and just travel. And then I have a plan B for my competitive season, uh, which is competing with the NPC here in France. So it's mm. the IFBB Pro League because... I, I I think the posing for the NPC suits me much better than the WNBF. Unfortunately, I want to compete in natural federations, but the posing just doesn't suit me. And it's it's kind of a shame because I want to display my, my physique as best as I can. And I really enjoyed the NPC shows as well. So I'm going to do both. And that's my plan B for, for my competitive season. And then um, that would last until December 18th. So it's going to be a long season. And then I'm going to take two years completely off of dieting. I'm going to mass, I'm going to build muscle. I'm going to get mm -hmm. my period back. I'm just going to go back to just being healthy because yeah, prep, you know, uh, isn't super healthy, especially for females. So I'm just going to get right back on track with my hormones and just, you know, eating a bit more food for a long time and lift heavy things in the gym. Nice. That sounds like a very, very good plan that you have laid out for yourself. Do you feel like you are much better prepared this time around than the first prep? For sure. Yeah, this has been, um, it, it's been hard, but I am in this stage of acceptance with my hunger and everything. I told Steve in my check-in this week, hunger at this level is just like a, an old friend that's tagging along with me on mm. the journey. And I talk to it sometimes. Like, I feel like a crazy person. I'm like, I know you're there, but you know, we need to get fucking shredded, dude. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's happening, but I feel, I, I feel very relaxed i feel calm i feel at peace and i'm just ticking my boxes daily so that's that's the best i can do and i'm definitely bringing a much better package which is like it's already a win for me so i'm happy with that yeah no absolutely and this is something that steve and i have talked about quite extensively over the last uh, improvements in the podcast it's like maturing and the experience actually serving you well when it comes to treat or having a good relationship with food being way more relaxed about cutting as well that cutting becomes an easy task and sometimes i even said it here in one of my check-ins this week <clears throat> sometimes i feel guilty in saying that because i we are working of course with people who are struggling with the diet primarily it's not often that someone is struggling with the training side of things right because training when you really think about it um, you can see some decent results if you're just even acting like a bro, just go hard. Of course, it may crush some people at some point, but it's often not really the issue. And then uh, the vast majority of people, they have or they are struggling with the diet. And I'm feeling even guilty at times saying then that this time the cutting phase is even easier than the last time. And the last time was already much, much easier than the previous time and stuff. But it's often overlooked um, what it took to actually get there uh, and I'm I can only speak for myself that I had like ups and downs when it comes to that I don't know how it is for you Mike at the moment you've been now gaining since like 2014 basically right yeah it's not probably not in a straight line where you've just been in a caloric surplus for that entire time um, how do you feel about like how has your relationship with food changed and has it ever been like 
not the greatest, especially after your first show in 2014, or has it always been like not an issue at all for you? No, I'm really glad you said that, Pascal, because I kind of feel on right now, I feel on the opposite end of the spectrum to Jess, where I think I'm struggling for different reasons, where it's it's the summer and I actually look, I don't look good at all. You know, I look <laughs> like I look like a whale, you know, and, I look, you know, and I'm like, oh, I just want to get shredded. Um, and I know like it would, you know, absolutely fall off me. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's kind of, again, like embracing the the challenge of it but from a different perspective knowing that you've got to know that you've got a long-term goal that you've got a long-term plan in place and really trying to stick to it and actually knowing that you know the discomfort is different for me it's the discomfort of actually leaning into that kind of um you know knowing that the package is underneath it's like you know dave is you know uh was it david the marble statue is underneath the marble and you've just got to have faith that it's there and that the more that you're going through that, you, that it's going to just help bring that out. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm struggling right now. And I even to be open and honest, you know, I even said to Steve, you know, I, I'm not, um, I'm not too confident, uh, sending progress pictures because, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to, you know, it's that, um, seeing myself and being like, Oh God, but you know, Steve made a really good point where actually, do you know, if you look at this objectively, when you look back the next time you mass at the same weight, you can see the improvements. It's a good marker. And again, just kind of coming back to that bit more objective kind of stoic, uh, like outlook on things. Um, so that was really helpful, but again, just really interesting. And, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Really interesting. No, absolutely. And in terms of like, you, you brought up a couple of good points. Um, first and foremost, in regards to then taking pictures, I'm exactly the same. When I'm in my off season, I I feel very uncomfortable and then taking some progress pictures. And I'm getting very complacent when it comes to that. And I don't even take them, even though that I should. And this is also something that I commonly do with my athletes. Of course, I keep them accountable. And I have no one for myself other than myself to keep me accountable. So this is already a positive aspect of it. But I trade physique update pictures and also girth measurements. Um especially in a gaining phase it's not there to actually see how much muscle mass you've gained i not in the initial moment because that is something that you can't really detect fat mass water retention will probably mask those things and if you are lucky of course you can look still very very good but that, that doesn't mean that you have gained like oh, i've gained 10 pounds of muscle mass or so um i think the the coaches who claim or who say that to some of their athletes when they are taking some new gain uh, gain photos or gain physique fo- photos, they are either intentionally deceptive, which can, of course, be a positive thing if you really think about it from a motivational standpoint, or they don't know even better, right? that they believe it themselves. But in reality, for me personally, I only take those pictures and measurements for future reference points. It's It doesn't really matter now. It's more an accountability tool for now so that we can double check that you're not gaining too fast um, because then you can really detect it in the pictures, but not in the sense of like muscle mass building, but more so like fat gain. And uh, and other than that, other than it being an accountability tool, it's more like then for future reference, right? Nothing else. And I think that too many people are too fixated on like the pictures in a massing phase and I had it often already that um, clients then ask me, like, you're, you're not really commenting on the physique update pictures now. Why is that the case? And I'm saying, like, okay, because it's basically not really relevant for you to, for me to comment on something that is quite obvious. We are in a gaining phase. Um, but it's more so than for future times so that we can look back like one year from now and be like, all right, this is you at the same body weight in the same circumstances. So both times in a gaining phase, maybe in the same kind of uh, part of your training block. And then you first can compare those two things with another. Um, just I don't know how you handle that with your clients, whether there are even some things that I'm even missing when it comes to treating those um, data points or, or measures and how you interpret that with your clients and yourself. Yeah, I, I have a lot of females that struggle pushing their body weight up in the off season. Um, the, the cool thing 
recently I've gotten a lot of applications from females who want to mass, which is really good because that's been, you know, it, it it's been quite recent before that. It's always like, I want to be cutting. I want to be cutting. And now they're like, I want to build muscle. And I'm like, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell them just treat it as data, the same as the body weight on the scale, the same as your macros every single day. This is just data information for me. You can take the picture, send them to me and just never look at them again. And I'm fine with that. And in a year from now, when we are cutting or we are building again, we can look back and see the differences. So just treat it as data. Uh, Even the body weight on the scale, the that, you know, when it's creeping up in the off season, females tend to be uh, uncomfortable because they're like, oh, am I getting fat? Or like, just seeing the numbers can be difficult for them. Uh, And I tell them, hey, we're going to be pushing to 150. I had this one client and she's like, 140 and i'm like we we easily can push to 150 because your body composition right now is still super good and we had been gaining already like 10 pounds and i'm like we can push and she's like 150 is such a big number in terms of like like it's mental like 150 and i'm like we got this and now we are at 150 and yes there's some body fat with it but the improvements the strength in the gym the performance and we know that when she's going to be leaning out, she's going to be looking so different from the previous time she was like 130, for example. So I just saw them treat it as data because that's what it is. It's just data points for me. So don't don't take it too too seriously. I think it's hard though for especially for for athletes um, because they lack the experience most of the time in how to interpret the data. <clears throat> and we all know that ourselves, right? Looking at our own data, we get quite emotional still, even though that we have the experience maybe. And when someone is coming to you, most of the time they don't. Um, we see it on a daily basis with a lot of our athletes, how the body composition is changing, and we can put it in perspective. And the vast majority of people they don't and you can't really blame them for that because they are maybe not personal trainers themselves they are not handling that on a daily basis or weekly basis and the only thing that they are confronted with is of course like the amazing pictures that they are seeing over on social media and that gives them a, a false sense of insecurities actually right which in reality is unjustified um so what, what i would like to know from mike then is he's laughing already it's it's all right mike um so because you've been on this endeavor now of being away from this uh, from from the stage for such a long time um do you have the feeling that you have gotten way more relaxed with the off season because this is also something that steve and i have talked about quite substantially over the last couple of improvement season podcasts With time, I have the feeling that I got way more relaxed about the entire journey. At first, I was just super fixated. I was also the one who's actually going to the gym and always having a, I don't know, angry face on when in reality it was absolutely unjustified, right? It's it's an enjoyable time. It's an enjoyable ride. We started to lift weights, hopefully, in order to improve things. Um, your, Your connection and your relationship with lifting and nutrition, has it change positively because you're not as fixated on it anymore and you're just like acknowledging that just time probably changes the most about you hi guys steve here just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of the revive stronger member site inside you'll find a thriving forum a growing exercise library presentations research reviews and courses if you want to get involved sign up via the description Absolutely, completely. I would say more relaxed with with my eating. Um, I would say probably two, maybe even later, you know, one to two years ago, I would be like scales. It would not go above like one gram above the target measurement that I wanted. Like if it was 200 grams of something, it it could not be 201 or 202. It's like (laughs) 200 spot on. Even if I had to like make this weird cut in the food, it would just, it would be that measurement. But now it's like kind of, you know a bit of this bit of that kind of thing uh whatever like today like i've just been kind of because my throat's fit so i've been smashing the honey and i haven't you know been really too meticulous with it so i think it's yeah definitely more relaxed about it um 
I think it's good not to try not to be too far away from that and be, because then I think it gets to the point where, you know, you, at the end of the day, you don't know what you're tracking. And, and again, you kind of, yeah, it's, re it's really hard to then, you have to go back to the drawing board a little bit because you're like, right, what am I actually taking in? So I think there is a balance there. Um, but I would definitely say I'm, I'm more uh, relaxed uh, and more flexible. So that's the, probably the word that I would use. So if, um, you know, if I'm going out, if my, I was really, I would say, if my schedule changed, it would cause a bit of anxiety and I'd be like, oh, you know, who, you know, I've got to do this or I've got to sort that out. I haven't got a meal with me or whatever. But now it's like, oh, no, no big deal. I'll go to Tesco's, I'll grab a sandwich or whatever, you know, no big deal kind of thing. Um, so I think it's definitely be help, being helpful from that perspective. And I I'm, would be really interested on a personal reflection point of view to see if I can maybe take that more flexible, psychological flexibility and try to implement that into, into my prep and into kind of my contest preparation. Yeah, I'm still having a very hard time putting that across to my athletes, to be honest. Um, because when people approach you and they um, they come to you for help, of course, they want to take advantage of your experience as well. And it's then up to the coach to communicate that to the clients appropriately so that they understand what they need to do in order to avoid some certain mistakes, right? And I, I've yet, I don't know if I put it across well, to be honest, when it comes to these kind of things. Uh, as already mentioned, I have gone through ups and downs, extremes ups and downs when it comes to these things. And I would, I'm now at a point where sometimes I'm just like, don't worry about it. Yeah actually quite often also when it comes to training like uh, do you feel it and um, do you feel the training i it's so simplistic <laughs> yeah. it's so simplistic and that's the same when it comes to to eating as well do you do you think you're eating healthy just a very simplistic question right that i think the vast majority of our audience um could actually answer wholeheartedly with a yes or no I don't know if the answer is no, then you know what to do maybe, right? And you can actually improve upon that one already and then things may get better. Um, so I don't know, Jess, have you found in regards, you're very good at communicating, I know that. Have you found any kind of tips and tricks in putting these kind of things across to the people and actually helping them understand what they need to do? So when it is when it comes to like, I don't know, don't worry about it too much. It doesn't really help most of the time in saying, okay, don't worry because they are still worrying. Yeah. Have you found any kind of things that are truly helpful for your athletes and also for yourself maybe? Yeah, it, even for myself, for sure, is just to be prepared as best as you can and always if if everything goes to shit because it's going to happen i tell them life is ups and downs there are going to be good days there are going to be bad days there are going to be unplanned things that happen i have often the case with clients where like oh they threw me a birthday party like a surprise birthday party or like we went out and i got hungry and i had nothing on me and i tell them the best thing you can do in that situation is the best thing you can do. It's literally as simple as that. It's like you can control what you can control and you can't control what you can't control. So if you have an option that's easy for you to, to get, you can just do that. If you don't have anything, then you just have to accept that you're not going to be starving yourself. I had the, the issue last week with a client they were out with friends and everybody was picking a restaurant where there, there wasn't like a good option for her. And uh, she ended up eating something that she wasn't even enjoying because it looked like it was the healthiest option on the menu, like the lowest calories, the easiest thing to track. And that's usually a red flag in my head when I'm like, okay, you still want to be aligned with your goal, but you're there with your friends and you're actually not enjoying the food that you're eating. And I'm like, on this kind of situation, wouldn't be healthier because health is also mental health. It doesn't have to be just eating healthy, you know, it has to be like, oh, am I enjoying what I'm actually eating? Wouldn't it be healthier from a mental perspective to just have the food that you want and understand that it's going to make your body, your, your weight loss just stall for a day. 
wouldn't that be easier? And I tell them like, obviously not to stress too much about the things you can't control. And that's simple to put it this way. It's too easy as a solution, but it is, it is the reality. Sometimes you can't control it. And I'm like, you might as well just enjoy that. Obviously it's not a situation where everybody will be confident not going overboard because if you give that room to some people, they will go crazy and just, you know, order the burger and the fries and the desserts. And that's when I teach flexibility and balance. And I'm like, you can enjoy eating out if you want to just make sure you're trying to, you're trying to stay mindful about things and conscious and make informed decisions, have a protein source, but don't, you know, have a, a salad that's going to bring you zero happiness in the moment that you're trying to spend with your friend have a steak, have a baked potato, have some veggies on the side, you know, it's easy, it's pretty easy to track, you can just assume what you're eating. And, you know, again, control what you can control, don't make yourself miserable, because that will just be worse in the end. So I think the mental health aspect of everything just has to be taken into consideration, if that makes sense. It does. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on that one, and I totally agree with that. Um, thing is, it's hard though if you are if you don't have the experience and the knowledge of what it means to eat mindfully, what it means to be flexible, right? Um, it's the same right now. <laughs> since since like a couple of days, I'm having like a, a tightness around the chest, right? And I had in the past hard arrhythmias, right? And then this raises some concerns and you can't, so I have a very hard time interpreting that pressure, whether it's muscular or from a blockage in my spine that it is actually causing that tightness or f stemming from my heart, right? And then I'm sitting there and I'm reading up like, okay, what type of pressure uh, is it that someone who is going through a heart attack is experiencing, right? And then they are saying like a strong, painful pressure on the chest. For me, who has never experienced that and gone through something like that, I'm just asking myself like, what does a painful uh, pressure on the chest actually mean? Right? And that that may be this, I know it's, a, <laughs> it's a far deviated from the actual thing, but... Um, it kind of gives nuance to the thing of inexperience and that I'm not knowledgeable about, around it because I've never gone through it. And maybe it's the same for some, or not maybe, but I'm quite certain that it's the same for a lot of people who have never gone through a situation like this um, where you're then telling like, okay, eat mindfully, be aware of certain things, but because they have never gone through a situation like this, it's like words and maybe even just information on on a piece of paper but going into the um i don't know surgery and then doing surgery on another person is quite a different task than just reading about it and i think that there always needs to be real life um experience as well and that comes with making mistakes and failing at times and that's totally all right but then over time you're getting better at it if you're not beating yourself up too much about it um mike i don't know if you have any kind of thoughts about it because you're nodding the entire time <laughs> I, I i can just relate to that so much from the perspective of the athletes that i i work with on a day-to-day -day basis so we find that the the new students and the new athletes that come in to visit um, that come to loughborough you know a lot of them have a really hard time differentiating is this an injury that i need to let mike know about or is this soreness from training that I'm not used to and trying to help educate those athletes to understand that difference is really hard and often it's just time and then either making mistakes or or we just kind of um you know going through that process together and it, it is literally a time and experience thing that they've got to do athletes who are better who are better at it have normally have normally already gone through an injury themselves and so they know that or they have a good awareness or perhaps they've just, you know, there's a maturity aspect to them maybe, um, but it's really hard. And I think I personally always try to build a relationship and encourage them to communicate proactive with me, proactively with me, because 
I would rather them at the start tell me if there's a niggle that they're experiencing so that we can just say, oh, no, actually, that's soreness. You don't need to worry about it. That's normal. That's part of training and adapting to what we want um, versus, oh, actually, this is something that we need to manage and we need to look after you a little bit and then and then go from there. So, um, so many kind of related links there, I think, and just to echo your point, I think it is just experience and time. Yeah. Do you have uh, also some thoughts on it, Jess? Yeah, I think it really comes down, as Mike said, to building a good relationship with your athletes and making making a, a safe space for them to be able to share everything, their thoughts, their concerns, their struggles, because, you know, if they just come to you once a week during the check-in, are like, hey, like everything went wrong this week and I just like, you know, threw the towel and went over my calories because I thought I had the freedom to choose whatever I wanted to choose to eat at the restaurant, like, it's not good. So you want to be proactive. You want to build behaviors. You want to build habits. You want to build confidence, competence for them to be able to be in, in and out and enjoying themselves, for example. So yeah, I think it really comes down to good communication and good relationship with the athlete. I think um, when it comes to bodybuilding, it's always funny because so many people approach it, especially in the first initial years and they have a an expectancy of like things happening and changing very very quickly um and then over time they're realizing okay it takes a lot longer to learn certain things but this is then where you are already at a stage where you've invested like five maybe ten years so the more you get into it it's kind of it's very similar to the dunning kruger effect the longer time you've actually spent with bodybuilding the more you acknowledge that change takes a long time and um, it's it's weird to me because we all kind of know for a certain skill or change to happen and to really really happen so whatever it is when we are doing an undergrad and a master's it takes like three four maybe five years or so but apparently when it comes to bodybuilding and changing something about the physique most people go in with the expectations all right, I'm doing something here for the next year or two, and everything has changed already. When in reality, when we're just taking a look at all of the other practices, if we want to get become good at something, we need to invest the time. And I think that it's crucial that we are aware of that uh, before going in uh, so that we know what we get ourselves into when it comes to that entire learning process. Right. But Mike, how long have you been doing this now for? So the show first show was in 2014. So you've been bodybuilding since like over 10 years then. Well, right? Yeah, well, I'd say that after 2014, I actually went into powerlifting for about maybe a good three years. Um, and I would probably say it was actually 2018 where I really committed to bodybuilding fully. Mm. Um, I think aesthetics or training for aesthetics was always my deep underlying drive um because even in powerlifting you know kind of you know you get that thing where it's like oh i won't do bicep curls i won't do any abs but i was always the person who did those things um yeah. because that was what i had that underlying drive um but i would probably say that it's only been for the last maybe three three years or so that i've really been you know fully committed to bodybuilding yeah and in that time um did you go into everything as well in that mindset of like, okay, I'm now training for like one to two years, then I have chiseled abs and everything is good? Yeah, well, um, what do you mean? Like, and then after that to stop or? or no, yeah, no, then being at a point where you're just like, I don't know. That's actually a really good point that you're making. Um, I think maybe too many people are going into that without thinking what will happen after they accomplish their goals. So let's just say someone wants to get fitter. Uh, what does that actually mean, by the way? And also, what what after what happens after then the building of the apps? Or so, um, and that is already something that I think many people go in with an expectation that is happening overnight. And what will happen after? Because I'm at a point where I'm just like, I said it already quite often, but this changed over the past two years two to three years for me personally when it comes to my mentality changing around training and nutrition that i acknowledge that i'm not the most genetically blessed but what am i supposed to be doing just mm -hmm. stop 
that doesn't yeah. make anything better at all, right? Yeah. And it's so funny when someone uh, over on YouTube says like, that what, there were some comments just like, you look like shit. Thanks, thanks for telling me. I'm aware of that. That's why I'm doing something to actually increase the possibility of not looking like shit anymore. <sighs> right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. there, there is no pseudo, uh, there's no option other than trying to force a change. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Force the change quick. Patent it. <laughs> put it on a t-shirt. Yeah. No, but in, in all honesty, that, that's the only thing. If you really want to see some change, you got to do the work in order to change that. Right? Mm. Um, and that applies to every single aspect of life, to be mm. honest. And also like knowing nothing stays the same. Nothing is permanent. Who you are right now is not gonna lie it's not gonna be forever who you are tomorrow you're a different we are different yeah. people tomorrow and your physique is ever evolving and for the better and for the worse because it might be in 10 years time you know our physique could look maybe worse but um actually you know not worrying about that but just you know accepting the accepting that change accepting that change is going to happen but you have a, a sometimes you might have a certain degree of control over that um and life circumstances change as well um, you know family or, or whatever um, yeah. and I think it's again just acknowledging that being kind to yourself um, and, and kind of just yeah being um, at peace with where you're at at that moment in time. Hey Pascal here I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service at Revive Stronger we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching and if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level hit the link in the description below. And one more thing, and that is you, you can control uh, to make a positive change, but making a negative change, you would need to really work hard for that. And if you're giving up, that would, of course, cause you to probably regress and cause a negative change. So if you really want to change something, just continue doing what it is that you're doing, prob and probably you will make progress. Maybe it's not the greatest amount of progress that you are able to see maybe there are certain other things that you can do but if you really want to make a change there's only one solution for it and that is putting in the work and that is of course uncomfortable at times but this is the only way how to actually force a change overall um don't know maybe you have uh, some thoughts on that jess my thoughts are really slow at the moment. I have a oh. brain full on, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do. Um, I think it's also a matter of finding enjoyment in what you're doing, you know, like embrace the journey, embrace everything, make sure you are grateful that you're able to do that. That's what I tell myself right now in prep. I'm like, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but I choose to do this you know like it's not someone didn't like put a knife on my throat and be like you have to be dieting and make yourself miserable and I'm like it gets easier you know like it's not as hard as my first prep and my next prep will probably not be as hard as this one um and I I really turn when nothing else works anymore I really turn to gratitude and I think mm. a lot of people forget the little things and it sounds very hippie yippie but it it is it is like it's been monumental for me to just realize that, hey, I'm I'm actually doing this because first, I want to, second, I get to, and third, like, it's going to make me a better person, it's going to make me a better coach, it's going to make me a better athlete, and yeah, I, I, as, as you said, I'm not gen genetically gifted, I know that, like, my shoulders aren't broad enough for bikini, my, like, my quads aren't big enough for figures, so I'm, like, in the in between things, but... I know that I work hard and I enjoy the process and I do my best every single day. I tick my boxes. And for me, being able to go to bed every night and knowing that I've done every single thing that I could during the day, it's enough for me to be able to fall asleep peacefully and, and just be at peace with myself. And I think that's been a massive change mentally for me the past few years where I was just chasing the gains and like what's the quickest way I can get this or get that and of course physically I've changed the since I've been working with Steve in 2018 so it's been three years already my physique is completely changed but mentally it's also it's also been a huge change and that comes with just 
more experience, but also more awareness. And I think a lot of people lack awareness. And again, it sounds very hippie yippy, but when I tell my clients that it's also, it's mostly like a mindset shift. It's also a mental change. And that, that comes like, it's even the, probably the forefront of my coaching with people. It's a lot of psychology. Uh, I do, I do love that. Uh, and I think it's important. Like anyone nowadays with the resources we have online can be a good coach in terms of like programming but if you don't have any communication skills behind it if you don't have any any like help that you can bring to your clients in terms of mindset and mental health I don't think you could be doing like you could be doing a better job for sure but yeah it's a it's a whole mindset shift and it's just knowing that you're doing your best and just being aware of every little thing that's happened every day and be grateful that you get to do that. And I just want to elaborate on the things that you have just said, because it's basically also applying to me, um, that I would assume that it's the same for you when, I, when I'm saying um, that you're not dogmatic about it. You're way more flexible, but you're way more focused as well when the time comes that you need to be focused. Instead of having uh, the switch on the entire time and being then overwhelmed by that and burn out at some point, you just switch it on when you really need to, then you're hyper-focused and then you switch it off again when when you need to actually relax and be flexible about it, right? Because it can come across like someone, all right, I need to be full hardcore, dedicated mode on the entire time, which in reality is, of course, not necessary and nor needed. And especially for longevity reasons, if you want to do it and pursue it for years on end, which is probably the only way to see significant changes, not just uh, physically speaking, but also mentally speaking, um, you need to know when to push and when to pull. And that also, of course, most of the time comes with time but it's very important to then acknowledge when those times are hard. Yeah. And I, I think that's also when a coach comes to play. I, I, I am really good at pushing myself. I would run myself to the ground and Steve knows mm. that, but Steve is my pull. He's my pull and I'm the push. And mm -hmm. that's why I have him as a coach because I would like every plateau that I have, I'm like, Oh, let's increase cardio. And I tell him during my check-ins, yeah, I feel, I feel okay. I can push. And he's like, we don't need to push right now. You're losing at a good pace. And I'm like, I could be losing more. Um, so it's, it's important to have someone in your corner that also is able to judge when you need to pull back, because sometimes you can't do that objectively. I know I, I, even with more experience now, I know I can't, I'm always, you know, comparing myself and be like oh wow those girls are three weeks out and they look more shreddy than me i need to be pushing more and steve's like we got this <laughs> yeah absolutely i have nothing really else to talk about to be honest uh, i don't know if if you have any other <laughs> ideas on the things that we've talked about um mike or well, now in regards to just the topic that jess finished with yeah um, it, was just, it was really interesting actually because a couple of things popped into my head and the first one is i remember Cliff Wilson saying in one of his first podcasts that some of the best athletes that he's worked with are the athletes who have had the ability to know, you know, like Jess says, when to push and when to hold back, you know, the athletes who have gone, you know, just the right amount of, you know, not going all guns blazing, but just the right amount. And I certainly have observed and I've heard people talk about, you know, some of the best athletes of all time in any sport they are the athletes who have the ability to switch and make that mental switch between right now's game time. Here's when I'm in, I'm all in and I'm putting in the work versus now's chill time to be able to switch from that parasympathetic, that rest and digest to that sympathetic, you know, all guns blazing. I'm ready to go kind of thing. And um, again, I think that's something which um, is, is really hard. It takes time and experience again to reflect on yourself um, and then just kind of, flicking a little bit i think it really incorrect with everything that we've talked about today it really helps to actually be an athlete yourself as well because it is only through your your learning experiences that you can relate to your to the athletes that you're serving and that we serve some of the mistakes that we've made 
we can go, no, hold on, you know, I've made this mistake myself. I've, you know, I've sprained my ankle or, you know, I've made that mistake dieting, you know, too much, listen to me or at least empathizing with them. Um, so I think, and, you know, a reflection that I had recently was that, you know, our struggles are here to help us serve others. Um, cause again, like it's something that we can just pass on our experiences to others. So I think that was, you know, a couple of things that just popped in my head. One more thing on that note, uh, because it's a common thing that is always popping up that some people um, think that it's essential that you've competed yourself in order to uh, prep competitors. And some people do think that it's not necessary. Um, I think it's definitely helpful because of the things that you said, right? Um, when you've gone through it, you can probably uh, relate to that much, much more. However, that doesn't really imply your empathy skills. If you've taken like 100 people to stage, you probably seen quite a lot of things, right? And can probably, if your level of empathy is quite high, I think that you have a very, very good understanding of what they are going through um, uh, in comparison to the person who've competed but only has prepped like two or three other people. Mm. And that is something often overlooked when people are bringing up that discussion. Mm. Um, I think... What is very important is empathy as a coach and, of course, also experience. And when these two things come together, I think it's way much, much worth than someone who stepped on stage themselves and has no empathy whatsoever, is a shitty coach as well, or is just selling their coaching service because they step on stage. That doesn't make them a better coach contest prep coach or so either and that is quite often overlooked when it comes to that discussion yeah e equally i would also add to that even more that i think how successful you are as an athlete does not determine how good you are as a coach um because i think sometimes you know highly successful athletes m might have you know might have good genetics and they might not necessarily know what it's taken for them to get there versus um you know maybe an athlete who has not had the best genetics or the best start but actually they've had to learn and work bloody hard to actually get that third place spot or to get that fifth place spot and they might be a far more successful coach and i think like again like they say that passion is for you purpose is for others and again like you could be the most passionate bodybuilder of all time but at the same time that might not be your purpose your purpose might be your yeah. be, being a coach so uh yeah Additionally, it's also there once again that bodybuilding seems to be one of the only sports where this is actually the case. When we take a look at other professional sports, um, there is no direct correlation with someone being successful as a bodybuilder then being or being a, a great athlete and then going in as a coach. Of course, some people, Zinedine Zidane, for example, um, great player, also then great coach over at Real Madrid. But this is the exception, right? Most people, they have just gone through a, a, a an education of becoming a coach. That's it. Right? That's it. They They learned the theory behind it. And now they are applying strategic uh, methods for then the team and actually then coaching the team. Um, and it's so funny because in bodybuilding, it's, it seems to be the other way around that everyone, else, everyone is expecting someone to be a great coach because he's a great competitor. So, yeah, which we know. It's, yeah, go ahead. It, it, it's really, it's really mind blowing that it's only like in bodybuilding that you see that like it's a very, it's a very sketchy sport sometimes, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. And I love bodybuilding. This is my passion and this is my purpose. Like I, I truly believe it's both. And you know, this season I've I've prepped athletes for the first time in my in my life as a coach, and I enjoyed it so much. And I, I enjoy doing both, but I agree being a good athlete doesn't make you a good coach. It definitely doesn't. It's really, it's really like separate it should be separate um on I, I have one more thing to talk about sure. before we wrap up it's just critical thinking and being open to change your mind that i think that's one of the biggest things that i changed my mind about during the past couple of years it's really being open and even chasing and embracing the change and being mm. actively open-minded to make sure that I I try to be the best version that I like of myself that I can be and I think that's been a the biggest change probably yeah 
this is a very so I have lots of thoughts about it. Uh, but this could be an entire <laughs> episode. It, it, it should uh, be. Itself. I think it should be um, a, an entire podcast episode. Yeah, because it's just it's so so broad and so many levels to it. And so, just on a short note, then, um, so many people don't even think about critical thinking, and that is already something where it's just like ah, and how can you get someone to do that? Um. And I know it's how that sounds, but before I actually went into bodybuilding and now looking back, I would say that I was quite a naive person and bodybuilding taught me so much about critical thinking because before that, not just critical thinking, but just also patience and working for also work ethic and many, many other things, but critical thinking is one of those things. Um, and I... I'm very appreciative of the fact that bodybuilding taught me that because never before was I really in desperate need of critical thinking in order to dissect the information to really move forward. Um, And I think that many, many people are losing themselves in it because life, most of the time, it kind of works out for the most people. And if something is all right, the vast majority of people don't really think about, okay, um, how can I make it better? And that's, I have a massive pet peeve with, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it mentality. I, I don't get it because that is such a lazy statement. It's it's like, if it's not broke, yeah, sure, you can, you can live your life like that. But that doesn't mean that is a good life either. That doesn't mean that you are moving forward. And we only have that one life. Right? We only have that one life. And that's over in just such a short period of time. And I rather want to make or take full advantage of it and do the very best instead of just like pissing around and each and every single day being Groundhog Day. And I was there, to be honest. Um, And I'm just 34 years old right now. And I hope that there are many more years to come. And first now I'm at a point where I can say like, okay, I've opened up my mind to many possibilities. And I think that in 20 years from now, I will look back at my current self and be like, you've still been so naive at that point. So on that philosophical note, (laughs) I leave it here. Um, Guys, where where can people find you? Just to give the usual disclaimer. Go for it, Mike. I think I've actually remembered my Instagram name this time I handled the time. (laughs) Um, So I'm at, um, at Physio Mike Chalice on Instagram. Uh, I'm not on Twitter, but Instagram's the best place to find me. Um, I haven't been immensely active on there right now, but um, if you message me, I'll try to get back to you and uh, I'll try to help as much as I can. Perfect. Jess? Cool. Jess Dogfish on Instagram and Fit by Jess, Revive Stronger on YouTube. I am vlogging my prep, I plug in, but I am putting a lot of effort and I actually enjoy sharing and and connecting with people through YouTube. So I'm not here to make millions, but it's been really fun and you can get a, a deeper dive into my prep. So yeah, I'm, I'm You're doing YouTube a fantastic now. job, Jess, yeah. by the way. I thank very much you. enjoy your vlogs. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Then thank you very much for coming on, guys. Um, hopefully your prep is then continuing to go well, Jess. Hopefully your off-season is continuing to go well as well, <laughs> Mike. And yeah, I guess I'll speak to you guys soon. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. 
So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're going to go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.